Hey animal lovers, welcome back to this YouTube channel on communication and social life of parrots. In the first video I introduced my four Red Lord Amazon parrots, explained how they met and became a group. In this video we will cover my parrots communication basics, so let's just jump right in. Pets have diverse backgrounds, and no matter how hard people work, the living conditions of any animals in captivity are always somehow artificial as animals in captivity usually lack many, if not all, of their natural and cultural influences. So, if you get parrots with different origins, it's likely that they have different backgrounds in terms of culture, communication skills, stuff they've learned, which shapes their personalities in different ways. Just imagine a parrot with such background meets a parrot with such background. It's probably like a human being from a big city meeting a human being who had been raised by wolves, who has lived isolated from human contact from a very young age, with little or no experience of human care, social behavior or language. Children who spend a long time in isolation are sometimes referred to as feral children. Despite sharing the body plan, biology and genome, they don't have much in common, share no language and so on with their fellow species members. If we bring together parrots with different backgrounds, in the beginning they don't have much of a basis for communication or interaction. So at first they have to work out a basis for dealing with one another. Usually that would take a couple of days, weeks or even months. The same applies when a human being adopts a parrot. There's not much common ground. In the first video I explained that Steffi moved in with me first about three years ago. Back then, we had no basis for communication either. We had to figure out how to deal with each other and that was a difficult undertaking, given the 300 million years of evolution separating us. Parrots and I hardly share relevant biological traits. Our sensory organs have evolved differently, adapting to totally different needs and different habitats. Parrots see ultraviolet light. Parrots see more colors, they hear and produce other sound frequencies. Instead of arms, hands and fingers, they have wings to fly. We are in different positions along the food chain. How shall we ever find common ground for communication? Sometimes I wonder whether it would be equally difficult to communicate with aliens from another planet. Well, at least Steffi and I were born on the same planet, so we should be able to make it. Some weeks into living together, I realized that Steffi was seeking my attention by using specific sounds. She did so by making a sound like a dog's panting. I have no idea how she came up with that. I guess she had tried many different sounds prior to, but had finally caught my attention. So Steffi is still sometimes using up to this day, meaning something like, hey you, I want your attention. Soon she combined with lifting one foot, which meant she wanted me to pick her up. Also, she combined with pointing her beak at certain things, which meant that she wanted what she was pointing at. In combination with lifting her wings meant that she wanted a shower and so on. So it was like she was using when she sought my attention, like some sort of a request bell. And once my eyes were on her, she specified what exactly she wanted. It's important that Steffi came up with that by herself. However, I encouraged her based communication attempts by reacting and doing what she wanted me to do. So she kind of taught me to do things for her. She basically trained me. Now you see why I sometimes call her Principessa Estefania, as I mentioned in the first video. Interestingly, Danny just copied Steffi's instantly and when he was still a baby. Also, after <laughs> caught my attention, he specified what exactly he wanted, so he joined the communication pattern Steffi and I had developed. For several months, Pippi and Jenny had somehow different approaches. As I mentioned in the first video, they have a different background. When they sought my attention, they tried many different sounds, including squawking, which I ignored, of course, because I didn't want to encourage ear deafening noise in my house. After five months together, Pippi suddenly began to use <laughs> two.
and on the next day, Jenny turned in. As Jenny is much smarter than Pippi, it's peculiar that adopting a new communication approach would take Jenny longer than it would take Pippi. I can only speculate about why it took Pippi and Jenny so long until they started using. Either they were just not getting it, as their earlier communication among their fellow species members has probably been totally different. However, given what other complex stuff, including human words, they easily figured out just by watching and listening to Steffi, Dani and me, I wonder why they would not get. <laughs> Another possibility is that Pippi and Jenny didn't want to support Steffi's and Dani's approach, as if they refused tuning into the other party's sounds. I wonder whether parrots would really act so politically, but I have some reason to believe so, as in my group of parrots it seems to matter a lot who starts using a sound who copies it and who modifies it further. Copying and mimicking sounds as well as refusing to do so seems to be the backbone of my parrot's interactions and communication. Thus, there are certain sound learning patterns. In the case of code sounds, as utilized in more complex languages, like the <laughs> approach, the pattern is as follows. So far, Steffi is the source of most sounds. She absorbs sounds from everywhere, modifies them, and implements them in her repertoire of sounds, and thus eventually into the group's repertoire of sounds. Steffi's priority is to impress or to manipulate me and other human beings. Dani never feeds new code sounds into the group's repertoire of sounds. He always only copies Steffi's sounds. Pippi refuses to copy any sounds for as long as possible. Instead, she tries to stick to the sounds she learned earlier from her fellow species members, and Pippi's sounds would only be picked up and replied to by Jenny. Eventually, Pippi would copy sounds from Steffi, and then Jenny would use the same sounds. With respect to dominant sounds, the pattern is similar, but slightly different. Again, Steffi absorbs many sounds from her environment. In the beginning, she does not necessarily use those sounds in a bossy way. It could be that she's just trying to mimic some human songs. When I respond to Steffi's performances by being delighted, Dani would imitate those sounds, melodies or songs, in a somewhat agitated fashion. And that's when those sounds and melodies turn into dominant sounds. In the beginning I was quite confused when Dani whistled German children's songs with an agitated fashion and tried to outperform Steffi by volume. Later I realized that he was trying to be more impressive than Steffi. The two of them can perform quite funny duets with Steffi singing in a lovely way and Dani singing in a pissed off way. And they would wind up each other more and more. Sometimes other parrots visit us, and sometimes we visit other parrots. Danny would then pick up sounds from other dominant parrot individuals. If they tried to impress Steffi or me, he would try to outperform any potential rivals with their own dominant sounds at the highest volumes Danny could produce. So he demonstrates that he can be loudest. Others are not supposed to challenge him, otherwise he gets angry. He must have the final say. He doesn't care if the rival is a fellow species member or a macaw. Sometimes he reminds me of the small dogs, which bark at other animals several times as big as the dogs. Pippi is copying dominant sounds from both, Dani and Steffi, and from other dominant individuals. Pippi is not very agreeable. Instead, she's quite forward and resists as much as possible against Dani's bossy behavior. However, she never really challenges him. Jenny would mostly only support Pippi's position through echoing Pippi. In their repertoire of sounds, there seem to be different sound clusters for certain occasions and moods. As far as I can tell, many of my parrot sounds can be put into those categories. There are several good mood sounds, And there are several sounds to express dominance <laughs> anger frustration 
playfulness, a cuddly mood, and so on. The sounds can merge into one another, so concern would build up into objection, then into protest, and then build up into outrage. Sounds of outrage can then deflagrate or turn into sounds of dominance. Those sound clusters in their repertoire of sounds are the common basis my parents came up with after a few weeks of living together. Most of it goes back to Steffi and to what Steffi absorbed from her environment. So, those sounds are highly variable. In another group of parrots, the basic sounds can be totally different. On top of that, there are ways to express more specific things, such as agreement or disagreement, greetings and indifference which evolved from those basic sounds. And the longer my parents live as a group, the more complex the communication gets. Over time, they developed ways to express very specific things, like some sort of a name for me. Here you can hear the sounds that label me. I can't tell whether it really is a name for me or just an announcement like, now we're gonna have fun. Anyways, these sounds are exclusively linked with me. The birds use them in no other context. First you hear Jenny vocalizing, then you hear Danny and Steffi vocalizing too, whereby Steffi's sounds overlap Danny's sounds. Again Jenny and Steffi and Danny. Whenever one of them hears or sees me, they would announce me. And in case they are very noisy, they would tell each other to shut up, because I never enter their room when they are very loud, because I still don't want to encourage an ear-deafening noise competition. Interestingly, there are sounds only girls would make. They tend to command and manipulate others. They want to be cared for. If they are hungry, they tend to ask and beg for food. Accordingly, there are sounds boys would make. Boys appear much more direct and straight. They wouldn't ask for food, but just go to the feeding bowl and eat. They chat much less, it seems. However, when they engage in a chat, their priority seems to be about letting the environment know how important they are. For each sound, there are different group learning patterns. How new sounds enter the group's repertoire of sounds can be an indicator of what's going on in terms of group dynamics and politics. Over time, their common repertoire of sounds continues to evolve. As I mentioned in the first video, parrots' brains are configured for living in groups. In such groups, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of social jabber, babble, sound propagation and sometimes noise. In my group, there's like a constant group broadcasting. Each member constantly broadcasts and constantly receives others' broadcasts. It's like each one is a radio and constantly sends stuff out to the group or certain individuals. At the same time, they constantly receive other sounds. They are constantly on air and constantly on standby, receiving what's going on with the group. If, for instance, in a chat someone expresses a concern, then those sounds of concern would be picked up and repeated by each member of the group, for as long as the members are concerned. In the next moment, the concern sounds could merge into outrage sounds, which could then continue for minutes, but could also be ended abruptly by Danny trying to silence everyone, via dominant sounds. And Dani's dominant sounds, you may have guessed it, may or may not be accepted by the others. If not, Dani could evoke complaining sounds, or he could evoke other sounds of dominance, and then of course engage. I think a group of parrots would only be silent when the parrots sleep, when they clean their feathers, and when they want to remain unnoticed, as they are up to something that might displease others. Brief side note here, Whenever your group of parrots goes quiet, you should get up immediately and check what they are doing. For as long as they chat loudly, you can stay relaxed. So during chatter, there are distinct sound propagation patterns. 
which oftentimes turn into complex sound propagation networks. It matters who begins, who replies, and who changes the chatter's direction. Sometimes it seems like each member must comment on each subject or topic in some way. Things happen very fast. Within a few seconds, a serious incident could rise and be settled. Steffi, Dani, Pippi and Jenny seem to have distinct voices. As I know Steffi for the longest time, she is my reference. That's what Steffi sounds like. Hello. Dani sounds a bit pearlier than Steffi. Hello. Jenny's voice sounds a bit deeper, somewhat darker and sharper. Hello. Pippi's voice often overturns and her timing is sometimes a bit off. She sounds somehow happy and light. <laughs> And here are their voices vocalizing in a more bird-like way. Steffi. Dani. Jenny. And Pippi. That's how I distinguish them. And as I can tell their voices apart, I'm sure they can too. I would argue that the sounds of their voices provide information on the individuals. Some chatter is repeated over and over each day for a couple of days and weeks. Some chatter is highly variable and I can't hear any repetitions. The sounds of parrots are acoustically complex, messy and condensed. Trying to follow their chatter can be very exhausting for me. After three hours of listening to them, my brain is seriously overloaded. However, with more practice, I can stay tuned in their parrot broadcast for longer and longer. Still, most of their communication I don't understand, as I am human. I am limited by my human hearing and human vision, and I am affected by human thinking patterns, which, as you may remember, are shaped by 300 million years of separate evolution, different adaptations to totally different environments and different positions along the food chain. So, my perception clearly is a bias, regarding those parrot communication basics I just introduced. Another bias is that I and the sounds of my world influence them a lot. The sounds I understand are the ones they also use when they communicate with me. There are many more sounds that I can't really put in categories. Sometimes I can't even interpret the context. But despite my human background, biases and limitations, I can still report what I observe. Of course, I can't tell whether my parrots display natural behavior, as they were all bred in captivity, and I can't tell either whether their fellow species members in the wild would set up similar communication patterns. You may remember the different origins of the four birds, with Steffi having been quite isolated early in her life, with a strong human imprint, just like a feral child. Pippi and Jenny have been surrounded and socialized by many fellow species members, and Dani was socialized by feral child Steffi and others. However, these patterns seem to work for all four of them, and they also run when my parrots interact with other parrots. So I would assume that the just explained basic communication patterns agree with the biology and thinking capacities of many of those Central and South American parrots. The components, individual voices and flexible allying, a group of parrots has a common repertoire of sounds, similar to the word pools humans have. There are different sounds for different situations and moods. Sounds can be picked up everywhere and at any time. A group's repertoire of sounds constantly evolves. There's constant chatter and very fast exchange of information. There are highly variable sound propagation strings and networks. And there are also code sounds, which seem language-like, like my name. With those ingredients, my parrots set up an efficient communication that helps them to organize their relationships, exchange information, conspire, manipulate each other and others, and establish a collective existence, providing both space and platform for everyone who tunes in. Not bad for a very young group of parrots.
I would bet that their wild fellow species members have way more incredible communication patterns due to their high intelligence, their collective learning culture and long-term transfer of communication patterns across generations. But that's pure speculation. Nobody knows what and how wild parrots chat with each other. However, if a very young group of parrots in captivity has such potential and develops such cool patterns, why shouldn't their wild counterparts perform at least equally? Thank you for watching and see you next time.